Pierre and all of you who have assembled for this important topic. So when I was in India, so I was born uh, and raised in India. I came here and finished my high school and then uh, bachelor's in biology and then medical school. So when I was in India, I used to have major misconceptions about people in America because I used to see many Hollywood movies. And my perception about each single one of you is what I see in the movies or what was portrayed to me in the media, the Indian media. So when I came here, obviously I realized, you know, the, the reality of life, the neighbors and the community is unlike what you see on the media or the movies. So that made me realize that I should not be judging any community, any faith, any nationality based upon the narrow perception oftentimes that we receive from the popular media. So I'm really glad that uh, your meetup group, I'm coming here for the very first time, that you're doing this uh, important uh, topic. Uh, the, this topic of Islam and the Islamic background, philosophy, culture is so misunderstood because of that misunderstanding, unfortunately, there are uh, many walls between communities and, com uh, you know, and races and different faiths. Uh, there are unfortunately discrimination and uh, there is a spike of 67% uh, spike in the hate attacks uh, against uh, the Muslim community in the USA. Since uh, 2001, since 911, close to 35 mosques have been burned down in the USA, right? Now I'm not speaking about any other country in the world, right here in the USA. And I would say all of these, uh, you know, unfortunate events could be avoided to a big extent when people come here as uh, brothers and sisters in humanity uh, and educate each other and learn from each other. And that's when we can find out that there are so many common things that we have between each other. So I'm really glad that uh, Jason and the, all of you are doing this. Uh, so the topic that was given to me is, what is the Islamic worldview? So they are, they are close to 2 billion Muslims in the USA, uh, and we reside in 57 Muslim majority countries. So if I'm going to ask you this question, and you can chat, the, you can put your answer in the chatting area, which country do you think is the most populous Muslim country in the whole world without Googling it, all right? Which one do you think? Uh, not Pakistan, wow. Okay, all of you got it right, right? Indonesia, not Egypt, not Egypt. Indonesia is the most populous country, Muslim country in the whole world. So I say that there are more Muslims in the Far East than in the Middle East. Surprise? Because many a times when we think about Islam and Muslims, we kind of concentrate ourselves, we focus ourselves. The Hollywood focus itself on the Middle Eastern countries, may that be Saudi Arabia and Syria, Lebanon and Yemen and Afghanistan in that area. But where I'm coming from, actually there are more Muslims in India and Indonesia combined than all of the Middle East. In the USA, they are close to about 3 million to 7 million Muslims. Uh, and the Muslims have been living here for many centuries, actually. Many, many centuries, you know. In fact, according to New York Times, the initial presence of a Muslim in the USA was in the year 1529. Almost five centuries, right? Almost five centuries. And in the USA, they are close to 3,000 mosques. Anyone been to a mosque, by the way, just wave off hand or just riding on the chatting area. Yeah, you did, Jimmy, good, good, good. So yes, and uh, yeah, so that's kind of the brief uh, statistics about you know Muslims globally and Muslims in the USA. So when it comes to Islam, uh, it's important that uh, when we realize the wonderful ways that uh, Islam teaches philosophy, that Islam teaches uh, the worldview about why we are here and the purpose of life, you will find out there are many, many commonalities and there are many things that hopefully you are able to understand. And in the Q&A session, uh, we can have a hopefully good vibrant and interactive session. Phil, your hand is raised up. 
would you like to say something? You want me to say something to you, Phil? Unless it's by mistake, it's okay, no problem. No, oh, it's a mistake. No problem, you can put it down if you want. <laughs> Thank you, sir. All right, so imagine that if you are traveling in a train, right? All of you, Jason and all the friends over here, imagine if you're traveling on a train and then you open up your eyes, you were sleeping, now you open your eyes and you find out you are in, in a train. The very first thing that comes to your mind perhaps is, you know, where am I? You know, what is this thing all around me? If this is a train, where is it headed? You know, who placed me over here? Uh, where is it headed towards? What is the destination? What am I supposed to do in the train? Just sit and, you know, stare in the window. What should I do? So we say, Islam says, that there are four fundamental questions that every thinking human being, they ask at least once in their lifetime. The very first question is, where did we come from? Means who created us? And the second important question is that, okay, fine, if there is a creator and I'm here in this world, what is the purpose that I am, I was created for? So what is the purpose of life? Important question, fundamental question. We will deal with that also. The third important question that all of us perhaps at least once in our lifetime, we asked ourselves is, okay, where is the guidance? What guidance, what instructions that we should be following? And obviously the last important question, there could be many questions. I'm just boiling it down to four questions, right? So the last important question is, uh, after we die, is that the end of it? Or is there going to be a hereafter? If there is a hereafter, how is the hereafter like? Is it like eternal bliss? Is it like reward up there? Is it like accountability, resurrection, hell, paradise? What exactly the hereafter is if there is a hereafter? So really quickly, we are going to uh, go through the four important questions. So that will be the crux of my presentation. And then obviously we can take any question that you may have. All right. So we say that, yes, we believe in, in, a, in a creator. So of all the faiths in the world that I have studied, I say that Islam is the most monotheistic of all the faiths. And what do you think is, uh, well, I think I gave the answer over here, right? So the name of God in the Arabic language is Allah. Really important point, Jason. When we say the word Allah, we are not referring to the God of the Muslims or the God of the Arabs or a tribal God. When we say the word Allah, we are referring to the same creator. We say who created all of us. For example, if I'm going to again keep you engaged, right? What do you think is the name of God in the Hebrew language, the language of the Old Testament? What would you say? Just typing on the chatting area. What would you say? The name of God in Hebrew language, Old Testament. All right, uh, Yahweh, Yahweh, Yahweh. Uh, okay, all right. So <laughs> we have the word 100%, all right? Yahweh, wonderful. So yes, the so Old Testament in the book of Hebrew, I mean, in the language of Hebrews, uh, in the Hebrew language, it is Yahweh. Uh, in English, it is the creator. In uh, Spanish, it is Dios. In the Norwegian language, it is, uh, it is God, G-U-D. And in the language of Jesus, peace be upon him, who knows that what was the language of Jesus? It was definitely not English because English is only a thousand year old language. All right. We have many historians here. Aramaic language, wonderful. You guys did your homework. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> So in the language of Jesus, peace be upon him, the name of God, according to Encyclopedia Britannica, is Ilah or Allah, very close to the word Allah. So important, all of us, we believe we have the same God, but in different languages, you can call God in a different name. And in Arabic, it is Allah. So, you know, I was, uh, I was in Canada, Jason, last weekend for a presentation. I was teaching some Muslims up there. There were many youth and many kids, right, up there. So for them to make it easy to understand who God is, who Allah is, I made a simple acronym. And this is the acronym. A-L-L-A-H, right? Easy, hopefully. 
So the A stands for Ahad. Ahad means one. In Arabic, the word Ahad, just like in Hebrew too, Ikat, Ahad, it's one. So we say that God is one in one. We don't believe in the triune concept of God. We don't believe that God is multiple Godheads or multiple persons or multiple idols. We say that God is one, absolutely one, without any partners to it, right? So that's the first and the most important uh, uh, attribute of the creator, Allah. The L stands for, we say that he's the sole creator of the heavens and the earth. Nobody along with him and nobody besides him. You know, unlike the New Testament, uh, John chapter one, verse number three, it says that through Jesus, then God created the rest of the creation, right? But according to Islam, not Muhammad, peace be upon him, not Jesus and Moses, any prophet, any creation. We say Allah is the sole creator of all things in the cosmos. The next L, L stands for loyalty and submission and obedience should only be towards Allah, towards the creator. No one along with him and no one besides him. So again, in this point, it's important, Jason, that when we pray to God, it says in the Quran that we should directly approach God without any mediator. So that again is a distinct feature of Islam that unlike Christianity, unlike Hinduism, unlike other faiths, uh, we say that God is all knowing and all hearing. That means when we approach the creator, we don't go through any saint, dead or alive. We don't even go through Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. We don't go through animals, Jesus, Moses, or any, any other entity. We directly uh, approach and we worship the creator. Then the second last letter is A. A stands for the wonderful attributes that Allah has. His attributes only belong to him, not to humans, not to animals, not to any part of the creation, but only to the creator. So any one of you read the Quran, right? Just by raise of hands or typing up there. Okay, some of you have read the Quran, right? So when you read the Quran, almost in every single page, you will find the attributes of God. Right, the attributes of God. So some of the attributes of God is that he is one, he is eternal. So any being who is eternal does not need any parents. We say God is all powerful, all knowing, all hearing. Uh, he is uh, the merciful, the forgiving, uh, independent, and many, many attributes. So we say that his attributes in their perfection only belong to God, not to any human, not even to Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. And the last H over here is the opposite of that, that humans and the creation, they have their own attributes and they don't mix up the attributes with the creator. For example, I can be kind towards my family. I have three kids. I can be kind and merciful and forgiving towards them, but uh, God is the most forgiving, merciful and kind. So God's our attributes are in their perfection. Humans don't have attributes in the perfection the way God has, right? So these are the five different uh, uh, ways that we can define the concept of Allah or God in Islam. I think somebody had their hand raised up, carry or somebody, I think unless they put it down, I'm not sure, or by mistake. No problem, if you want to raise your hand later, anytime, uh, you could do it, right? So let me go back now, all right. Now the next important point is, we say that, uh, okay, so I think I already mentioned this slide, so I'm not going to do it again. Just for the sake of your information, these are the names of God in different languages, the same creator, but in different languages, right? In Sanskrit, it is Brahman and different languages. And these are the attributes of God that I went over. And some of you from the Jewish and the Christian faith, you'll be amazed to find out that the commonalities that we have between uh, uh, the three faiths. Hey, uh, uh, I'm sorry. Can I can I say something? Is yes, it... go ahead. <laughs> yeah, I, I just I think most scriptures, right? Um, Hundred percent, I want to say mm -hmm. they do say that you know you really don't need any mediator, right? You know you can attain God yourself. Um, so I think the whole 
structure hierarchy that was created between uh, humans and God uh, was a human creation, right? And I think I at pretty much every uh, faith or every scripture uh, at the core root of it. I think that's that's pretty much uh, uh, what uh, they say. And that's that's I just okay. want to mention that. Sure, sure. I don't even know who was speaking because there are so many <laughs> over here. Who was it? What is your name, brother? Uh, I'm Shashi. Sashi, okay. Thank you, Sashi, for being here. Um, so it is important. Uh, actually, when you read the Bible, the New Testament, uh, they do mention Jesus as the mediator. All right. Uh, perhaps other scriptures they don't, but uh, our Christian friends are really emphatic in taking Jesus uh, as the mediator, right? I mean, uh, so just want to have that slight distinction. All right. Uh, so I'm going to speed up now because you know I want to take as many questions as possible at the end. So these are some of the references that speaks about the oneness of God in the Quran. I mean, almost every page has uh, something about the oneness of God. For example, it says in chapter 3, verse number 51, actually Jesus is quoted in the Quran and God is saying, and this is how the Arabic goes, so this is Jesus quoted in the Quran, and then the translation is, that surely God is my God, my Lord, and your Lord. So worship him, means God, this is the straight path to follow. And the rest of the references are up there. So that is who God in Islam is, right? So now the second important fundamental question is that what is the purpose of life? You know, why are we here? What are we supposed to be doing? So Quran says in chapter number 51, verse number 56, the translation is that God has created the jinns and the humans only with one purpose, that they should worship him. So this is chapter 51, verse number 56. For those who are writing notes, I applaud them if you're doing it, right? I do it when I'm listening to any lecture. Chapter 51, verse number 56 says, that the only purpose that God created the humans and the jinns, so jinns are a separate creation, by the way, is that we should worship the creator. But that you may be saying, you know, Jimmy and the rest of you, that Sabir, what does it mean worship the creator? Are we supposed to go to the church, the mosque, the temple, and just be there worshiping 24 seven? No, actually not really. Because worship in Islam is a co quite comprehensive concept. Yes, praying, prostrating, standing, bowing, that's one way of worshiping the creator. And we Muslims do it five times a day, that worship. Other forms of worship that we have is anything that pleases the creator is worship in Islam. So if I go in the downtown of Chicago, where I am from, if I give $5 or a meal to a poor person, a homeless person, actually in the eyes of God, I'm worshiping the creator because now I'm benefiting and helping humanity. If I'm taking care of my parents, that's worship in Islam. If I'm going to take care of my neighbor, she's 96 years of age, my wife goes there, we take care of her, that is, that is worship in Islam. Sharing our knowledge, having a smile on the face, making a person's life better, all of these are comprehensive way we can say this is worship in Islam. So anything that pleases the creator, we do with the right intent, we want to unify and bring humanity together, and help humanity uh, that we say is the purpose that God has created us, right? So that is the second question that what is the purpose of life? The next important question is that, okay, what is the guidance? What guidance are we supposed to follow? I mean, I have been to school. I mean, all of you have been to school and colleges. When we were in the school, I mean, obviously, when we go to school, we are expecting our teacher to give certain instructions and teach us something and some assignment and quizzes and then the final exam and the grading, right? A plus, hopefully. In the same way, the automatic question that I and all of us may be questioning is, if there is a guidance, what guidance that we should follow? So what does Islam say, right? So this is one of the most important slides that I'm going to share with all of you. 
This is one of the most important slides. So we say that God, when he created Adam, he did not left Adam alone on Adam's human shortcomings. So when he created Adam and Eve, Adam and Eve, they were given one instructions by God that enjoy all the things in the garden, but stay away from this, this one specific tree. God was testing them. It so happened that someone deceived them and they, they made the mistake. They committed the very first sin. But here is a slight difference between the biblical and other faiths point of view about the original sin compared to the Islamic point of view, two differences. First and foremost, Islam says in chapter number two, that it was uh, not Eve who made the first mistake. It was Adam and Eve equally, they made the very first mistake. So we say by jokingly sometimes that equality in Islam starts from day one, right? So they both made the very first mistake. Number two difference is that after they were sent on earth, we don't believe that the children who are born are born with the original sin. We say that everyone starts from a clean slate. We all start pure and innocent. We have the innate nature to do good. So we say that we don't believe in original sin. We believe in original goodness, original goodness, right? So there's an important concept in Islam. Every baby is born without any sin coming from Adam and Eve. So now as humanity was populating around the world, then God sent important commandment to Adam and Eve and, and then to the rest of the prophets that God chose from the humans. And that commandment was, this is in chapter 16 of the Quran, verse number 36. So it says in there that God, God appointed messengers to all the nations of the past. And their mission is to invite humanity to the worship of one God, following God's guidance. And that's the way to paradise. So if I'm going to pause up here and ask all of you this important question, that what do you think is one word in Arabic to describe the concept of absolute submission to one God? What is that one word in Arabic? Any one of you? Besides the Muslims who are here, you guys know this, right? <laughs> Our non-Muslim brothers and sisters. Go ahead. What is the one word in Arabic? Uh, Mark, man, you got it. I applaud you. Very good. The word Islam. No, not inshallah. Not inshallah, the word Islam. So we say Islam means submission to one God, right? So if you're, so I have a third grader. If you ask him, you know, Yusuf, what is Islam? He would say, Abuji, that's so easy. It means submission to one God, worshiping and following God's guidance. So in a nutshell, that is what I would say. The main concept, submission to one God in Arabic is Islam. So we say that humanity, as they were spreading around the world, and these are the references from the Quran. We say that every single prophet, every single messenger was given that important uh, uh, commandment by God that in, go and invite your people, that they should only submit, submit and worship the one creator, right? So it says in chapter 42, verse number 13 of the Quran, that uh, Abraham, Noah, Moses, Jesus, they were all given the same commandment, invitation to the humanity, to submission. Then Abraham, he's mentioned in the Quran that he, is, he was neither a Jew nor a Christian, but he was a Muslim. Same thing with Moses and Jesus. And then we say, last prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. So really completing this important slide. So the concept of salvation in Islam, I will come more to it later in the next slide. Then I will wrap up with that. Is that belief in one God and then doing good deeds. That's how God's mercy comes into play. And that's how a person goes to paradise. So believe in God means the way that God wants us to believe in him. Doing good deeds means not just praying five times, but in the comprehensive way, good deeds are to be done as it defined in the Quran and, and in, the, uh, in the sayings of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. So the philosophy of Islam is that only one faith was given by God to all of humanity. And we say all the prophets, they were followers of that faith. So the next quiz question to all of you is, what is the name for the follower of Islam. 
you know, just like you have Christianity and Christians, Buddhism and Buddhist, Islam and what? Excellent. You guys are doing really good today. I am proud. <laughs> Very good. So we say that every single prophet we say was a Muslim. So our Christian friends may be surprised to find out. Sabir, are you saying that Jesus was a Muslim? Yes, we say that Jesus was a Muslim. The Quran describes him as the submitter to the one creator. So some people in the past, they believed in God and Islam. We say some people, they moved away from it and they started worshiping idols and sun and the ancestors. We say that's how other faiths were formed by humans. But the only one faith that God has given as a guidance for humanity is the faith of Islam. All right. Uh, so this is point number three, and I'm going to wrap up quickly is, what is the guidance? So we say that God has given uh, scriptures to previous prophets and messengers. So Quran mentions a scripture given to Jesus, uh, to David, to Moses, to Abraham, yes, and to other prophets. The last time the scripture was given is to through Muhammad, peace be upon him, in the year 610. That's when the revelation started to come to Muhammad, peace be upon him. And he memorized it and his followers wrote it down. So what we have today is exactly the same Quran as was given to Muhammad, peace be upon him. And Jimmy, you'll be surprised to find out that no less than 15 million people who memorized the whole Quran, who are living right now, the whole book, front page to the back page in Arabic language, they memorized the whole book. So my own son, he's in the process of memorizing it. He's in the third grade. He's an excellent A plus student going to a really good school and memorizing the whole Quran right now. He has memorized close to 40 chapters of the Quran in Arabic. The Quran has 114 chapters, 114. So he's kind of close to halfway there, right? Very soon, hopefully he'll memorize the whole thing. It's a miracle, Phil, it's a miracle actually. 15 million people memorizing it, right? I mean, I cannot memorize perhaps biology 101 book, right? Or histology 101 book from my medical school. I cannot, but Quran is a miracle that many people memorized it. We say Quran also have scientific facts in there, 500 plus scientific facts. We say that the Quran does not have any contradictions. It has historical facts and prophecies. So we say, if you ask any Muslim, what is the greatest miracle that God has given? We say that it is the Quran. All right. So what are some of the some of the features of the Quran, right? What are some of the guidance? So these are the five pillars some of you may be familiar with. That we believe in the absolute oneness of God and we testify to that and to the messengership of Muhammad, peace be upon him. One of the actions Muslims are required to do to create discipline and connection with the creator is to worship five times a day. You know, just like we eat a certain times a day so we can nourish our bodies. So the concept is that we should be worshiping and taking a break from the hectic life at least five times a day to connect with the creator and to calibrate our spiritual compass. Giving charities and obligation, fasting in the month of Ramadan and going for pilgrimage. These are some of the commandments. I'm not going to go all, over all of them, but just to show to you that the comprehensive nature of Islam's commandments and guidance for humanity. Do not be rude in speech, right? So these are the references from the Quran. Refrain your anger. Be good to others. Do not be arrogant. You know, speak to people mildly. Be dutiful to your parents. This is one of the important commandments I would say, unfortunately, our Society is moving away from this respect of parents and grandparents, but Islam, this is one of the fundamental beliefs in Islam. After worshiping the creator, the second most important commandment that Islam says is that obey your parents, take care of your parents, be good to your parents, right? This is so important. Uh, and then many, many more commandments. So, you know, in the Old Testament, there are 613 commandments. In the Quran, perhaps, you know, about the same or perhaps more. So I'm not going to go over each one of them, but you can appreciate the vast comprehensive nature. So Islam is not just spirituality and rituals and worship. Islam is actual way of life. 
it's a dynamic uh, you know uh, it's, a, it's a dynamic faith we are supposed to be indulging in the society and making the society better spend wealth in charity encourage feeding of the poor uh, there is no compulsion in faith it says in chapter 2 verse number 256 freedom of faith uh, and what about prophet muhammad peace be upon him we say that he was a descendant of Adam. And if you look at the chart over here, it goes back to Abraham in one way, right? And Abraham had uh, two sons, Ishmael and Isaac, and then one more actually later. So from the branch of Ishmael came Muhammad, peace be upon him. From the branch of Isaac came these other prophets, including Jesus and Moses and Aaron, you know, all the other prophets. So ultimately we are going back to Abraham and obviously to Adam and Eve. This is a brief history of the life of Muhammad, peace be upon him. He was born in the year 570. And his father passed away before the birth of Muhammad, right? peace be upon him. And his mother died when he was only six years of age. Then he got married at the age of 40. He started to receive revelation. He started to preach the oneness of God and the beautiful guidance and solutions for humanity. And I can see a hand raised up there. Go ahead, brother. So I'm curious if you go back to the and my understanding of um, Islam is very elementary. So if you go back to the previous slide where you had like the descendant uh, sort of genealogy tree, um, can you fit in like the caliphs? Like are they? Because I've been hearing a lot of talk about caliphs. So sure, sure. On this chart. Sure, sure. So the so the question is uh, where do the caliphs where do they fit in here? So. They would fit right. In. Do you see my arrow? Your voice is breaking up. Uh, I don't see your arrow. Okay, so right underneath hear. Muhammad, peace be upon him, you would fit the caliphs. Because after he passed away in the year 632, Muslims elected the head of the states. So those head of the states, we call them as the caliphs or the khalifas. The caliphs means the successor to Muhammad, peace be upon him. We don't say that they were prophets because we say Muhammad, peace be upon him, was the last prophet. So they were the head of the states that followed Muhammad, peace be upon him, in the leadership of the Muslim nation of that time. Did that answer your question? Absolutely. Thank you so much. Uh, Wonderful. I'm glad that you stopped me there for any question. Very good. Very good. So let's move quickly. So this is kind of the life history of Muhammad, peace be upon him, right? Uh, he was preaching peacefully, by the way. Uh, then people boycotted him. He was surrounded by actually uh, people who used to worship idols and humans and the creation. There were very few Christians and the Jews up there, but mostly the people who were worshiping idols. Eventually, they came after his life. So he had to migrate from Mac Mecca to Medina, about maybe four hour drive if you drive in the car right but obviously he he rode in the camel or so he had to have 27 defensive battles because people kept on coming at him right the superpowers and other people to destroy him and the muslim community and the true islamic state so he fought 27 defensive battles from the year 623 until he passed away and then he came back to mecca and then he passed away, right? So the Quran was revealed here. He established the Islamic state and he shared the beautiful guidance with the people. And uh, I have a hand raised over here. Go ahead, please. Uh, yes, yeah, since we uh, were on the topic of uh, the Khalifas, I was wondering if you could speak very briefly to the split of the Sunnis and the uh, Shias. Okay, okay. So, okay. Fine. I was going to delay that later in the Q&A. Uh, um, oh, no, that's okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Whatever timing that flows better for yes, you. Yes, yes. Yeah. Yeah, because basically. it just takes maybe five minute answer compared to 30 second answer, right? So for that reason, let me just quickly complete it. Then I will come back to that. Is yes, that fine? Thank you. Wonderful. Yes, yes, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So here, here are some of the sayings of Muhammad, peace be upon him. Paradise lies under the feet of your mothers. You know, when it comes to mothers, uh, this is one of the sayings of Muhammad, peace be upon him. He said, so one time a, 
Muslim man came to the prophet and asked him this question, that of all the people in the world, who should be my love, my allegiance, my kindness should go towards? And Muhammad, peace be upon him, he said, your mother. So the person asked the second question, okay, fine, after my mother, who next? The prophet said, your mother. Then the person asked the third time, the prophet said, your mother. Then the fourth time he said, your father. So poor dads like me, right? And some of you there, if the mom and dad were playing a spiritual Olympics, the mothers will win the gold medal, the silver medal and the bronze medal. And poor dads like me, they come home with the participation prize. Status of mothers in Islam. God makes the way to paradise easy for him who, who trends the path in search of knowledge. Now gaining of knowledge is very important in Islam. It's an obligation. The believers who show the most perfect faith are those who have the best behavior. And the best of you are those who are the best towards your wives. Way back in Arabia, before Islam came there, people used to mistreat the women, second class, inherited as property to such an extent they were in the dark ages. James, you'll be surprised to find out. Then I will take your question. Is that having a baby girl born into a family is seen something as shameful for the family. Shameful, right? Baby girls. So they used to wrap up the baby girls. They used to take to the cemetery and they used to bury them alive. That was the state of darkness. So just imagine these sayings are coming in the context of that, that how we are supposed to respect our mothers, our wives, our daughters, right? Our sisters, how Islam uplifted women equal to man in the eyes of God, different responsibilities, but equal reward. You know, there are so many, let me just end with this one. Then, the, then I will have the last slide. Three things follow a dead person, members of family, his property and his deeds. Two of them return and one of them remain with him. The people and his wealth go back. His deeds remain with him. Really important, Islam and courageous. Uh, so let me just fast forward this to the last slide and the last important concept, which is the concept of hereafter, then uh, Neri, then I will also take your question. And I think, okay, fine, let me just wrap up. We have three people. So Islam's belief is that every single person who is ever alive is going to pass away. Islam does not believe in the reincarnation. Islam does not believe that after we die, that's the end of our existence. No, Islam says that every single human would be brought back to life. So there would be a day of resurrection and a day of judgment. And on the day of judgment, you know, just like in the schools and colleges, our teacher, our professor is going to... Uh, uh, judges, right? Judges based upon how we perform in the semester. In the same way, Islam says that our God is going to judge us based upon how we live this life for in two important things. What belief that we have and what deeds that we have done. If our belief is right and deeds are good, then not by our good deeds, but by God's mercy. He will put us into paradise. But if our deeds are wrong and the belief is not right, that means there would be consequences and Islam does believe in a hell fire. But it's not up to me or brother Nurul Sayyid or anyone else to say, you know what? This person is going to paradise. This person is going to hell fire. No, I cannot say that. All I can say is that this is what Quran says. Right belief and do, doing good deeds, then we fulfill the criteria for God's mercy. So in a nutshell, that's what Islam is. It's a challenge to boil down Islam, the humongous centuries and centuries into like, you know, half an hour, one hour presentation. I'm glad all of you are patient listeners. Thank you very much. May God bless all of you and guide you. Take care. All right, Jason, I'm done. Open for Q&A. Yeah, thank you. I think you still, uh, you, you decide how, how you're going to manage the question. I think uh, by our past experience, we always have a lot of questions and a lot of discussion. So, uh, sure, sure. I will take the questions yeah. in the order in which they have been, the hands are raised. And I believe the very first uh, person is James Cook. 
Uh, go ahead. Uh, me, uh, Dr. Sabir, are you, uh, do you want to stop sharing so we can see everybody's face? Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let me do that. Let me one second, Jason. Yeah. All right. Well, we have a lot of hands up. So, you know, I, it's a lot of questions. So, okay. Uh, Dr. Shabir, you, 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 you are the boss. So please handle. All right. Uh, so I hope that the way that I see on the screen is the order of the hands or else I have to go back over here. Let me see. You know what? No. The very first hand is uh, James. Go for it, James. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you for bringing your religion to us in a very pure form. I really appreciate that. Uh, my first question is, uh, I wanted to know if we're going to have access to these slides. And uh, the second question is, um, uh, you mentioned that uh, Muhammad fought defensive wars, but I understand he had to travel quite a distance to some of these battles. So, you know, what, how can you say that they are defensive since he had to travel such distances to these battles? And the third one is uh, I noticed the Quran, which I'm not uh, a, a very perfect reader of, is um, very heavily loaded in text at the beginning and then gradually statistically ends up being smaller and smaller chapters till at the at the end the last 30 chapters or so are only one page so i was just wondering is there an easy explanation for this uh uh kind of uh, this this uh you know it's it reminds me of like trying to fish, finish your homework in a hurry uh is there a, is there an easy explanation for the fact that uh there is such detail at the beginning of the quran but then very summary type of writing towards the end of it Sure, sure. So I think your very first question was, am I going to share the slides? Uh, definitely. God willing, I will send it to Jason and Romana. Are you here? I don't see Romana here. Maybe she's somewhere. Oh, I'm here, Dr. Shabir. You are. Okay, wonderful. Thanks a lot for getting in touch with me. She gave me a call. I was surprised. Who is this calling? That's how I got in, into today's event here in Jason too. You know, uh, uh, just just email to me and I will put in the uh, common box. Sure. Yeah, so you can everybody can take a look. And also this uh, uh this one is recorded and then so you can review, you know. So yeah, thank excellent. you. Excellent. Uh, and the second question, James, is how can I say that these were defensive battles when he had to travel a distance outside of Mecca, for example, or Medina? So it's really important, you know, for any military leader. And I'm not saying that he was a military leader. I'm saying for anyone to defend themselves, sometimes you have to go outside of the city to defend yourself. So he traveled to uh, outskirts of uh, Mecca, Medina. So he was not a sitting duck in those cities. If he were, then that would be a big compromise that he would be doing. That would be a big security risk for the women, for the children, for the old people. So he went outside so he can fight the battle and defend himself and the people there. This is just a military strategy, by the way, but they were defensive battles. They were defensive battles. I mean, I can go one by one battle, right? But we can do it some other time, but these were defensive. Even in these battles, James, you'll be surprised to find out that the ethics of battle that we made now today in the 20th century, 21st century, Islam had those ethics and far beyond those ethics uh, way back in the seventh century. For example, one of the ethics of Islam is that one of the guidelines, even in a war, is that uh, no killing of women and children. One time there was a woman who was dead uh, after one of the defensive battles, and the prophet called his uh, people, his Muslims, and he said that even in a war, do not kill women and children. That means no non-combatants non, non should be touched, harmed, or killed in Islam. Islam is so careful, even in a battle. Then it says, then it says, then Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, he said that taking one innocent life is like taking the life of all of humanity. Actually, this is a quotation from the Quran, chapter 5, verse number 32. So there is no carpet bombing in Islam. There is no Hiroshima Nagasaki in Islam. Uh, Muslim uh, army cannot cut down uh, you know, the trees destroy the animals, even of the enemy civilian population. We cannot destroy the resources of the civilian population, even of the enemy, right? And if the enemy uh, leaders, if they extend their hand in peace, 
the Quran says, chapter 82, verse number seven, you extend your hand in peace. So anyway, so these were defensive battles, right? And the last question that you asked was about, remind me, James. The statistical, the statistical uh, lack of detail sure. at the end of the Quran compared to the first chapters of the Quran, which are very large, but then gradually they get shorter and shorter and shorter until the last 30 chapters are virtually all about one page long. Sure, sure. So it is important that uh, the arrangement of the Quran was not done by Muhammad, peace be upon him, and the Quran was not revealed in the order in which it is there right now. Some passages of in the middle of the Quran used to come, some chapter used to be coming, some passages from some other chapter were revealed based upon the situation and the occasion at that time. So people not only know what the Quran is, they're able to apply it right away. So in that way, the whole Quran was revealed in piecemeal in 23 years, from the year 610 up until he passed away in the year 632. So we say that the arrangement of the Quran was not done by humans, not even by Muhammad, peace be upon him. It was done by the creator himself, right? So some chapters were revealed where he was in Mecca. Some chapters, they were revealed when he moved to Medina. So most of the chapters that were revealed in Mecca had to do about the oneness of God, you know, believing in the creator, that there is a hereafter, there would be accountability. Other chapters which were in the middle and the last portion, they were revealed for the actual instructions, day-to-day -day living, economic system, political system, educational system, matrimonial system, uh, the justice system. So that's kind of the demarcation, the Makkan chapters and the Madinan chapters, right? So, but once you read the whole Quran, uh, you can connect the dots and you can get a holistic picture, James. All right, uh, Phil, no, let me see who's next. Uh, it's not Phil, is it Phil? Phil, you're next, no, uh, Na Nari, you're next. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Um, sure. It's very interesting to know that the Muslim population in India and in Indonesia makes up, it's more than in the Middle East. And I think Muslims are getting a bad rap because of a lot of mis Middle Eastern conflicts and stuff going on. Anyway, I have three uh, questions. Wanted to ask you uh, the best tr translation for English of the Quran. There is so many people writing, you know, translating it from Arabic. What, what do you think is the best? Who is the best uh, translator for that? That's my first question. So then let me just quickly, uh, you know, reply, then you can ask the second question. Sure. Is that okay? Fine. So the question is, what can be a good translation? The best, I mean, there is no best, best, I would say a good translation, right? Because you cannot translate from one language to the other without losing, you know, the beauty of that language, original language. So I would say the closest good translation in the Arabic language, I will give you two. And maybe I can write it down in the chatting area, right? That will help perhaps uh, all of you. Um, let me see. All right, so one of them is called, and you can Google this and you can obtain it, the clear Quran. So that's one of them. And I think there is a website called theclearquran.com. You can find out whether uh, Nurul Sayyid, you can find out and let us know. So that is one good translation. The second translation was taken out by a committee by this uh, organization called Sahi International. S-A-H-E-E-H, -E -E Sahi International. All right. So both the translations uh, that my organizations that we use. So Jason, what we have is one of the services that we provide is that we have this uh, telephone line 1-800-662-ISLAM. Let me also write down here. Okay, good. So you have the clearquran.org, uh, right? So 1-800-662-ISLAM. So we established this way back in 1993 for any person anywhere in the US around the world if they have any questions. So besides answering questions, we also send out free copies of the Quran. And so far we have sent out 75,000 of them around the, around the USA, right? 
I mean, you can always purchase it on Amazon if you want, or you can contact us. Actually, the name of the website which I belong to, and you can also get the Quran from here if you want, uh, is gainpeace.com. Or if I want to make it hyperlink. So yes, Nari, so that those would be the true translations that I would uh, suggest to you. And besides those, so there could be other good ones, right? I mean, there are so many. I mean, literally, Quran has been translated uh, more than 100 languages, Spanish and different languages. So go ahead, Great. sister. What is yeah, your second yeah. question? Yeah, thank you. Uh, sure. So the other uh, thing you mentioned was paradise lies at the feet of thy mother. Uh, I, I agree with you, but, um, you know, there are a lot of good fathers out there. Sometimes there's mothers who cannot care for their kids or they give up their children. And, um, you know, so does it make a, 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 an adjustment? Uh, I, I don't know, the Quran, the Hadith, whatever, to educate people, especially Muslims, that maybe... Uh, it, it's not as black and white as it, it as you're saying. So that's a general, um, you know, guidance, right? There are always exceptions. There are always dads who are amazing compared to mothers. There are amazing mothers compared to dads. But the but the reason mothers are emphasized so much in Islam, and there are sayings about the fathers too, just to let you know, right? Just to let you know, there are amazing sayings about the fathers. One of the sayings is that both you and your wealth belong to your father. Not just your wealth, even yourself, what you have. I mean, your dads, you have to be thankful to dads, right? So there are sayings for both sides, by the way. When I only highlighted the mothers, it does not mean, you know, poor dads, come on. What about me, right? Where is the equality? No, Quran is balanced, but obviously, you yeah. know. I mean, it also could be for adopted parents, you know? Of course, yes. yes. Because they, they, they can become more... They are, they are really the parents to the child. I mean, you could give birth to somebody, but that's all, you know? Yes. You do not have that uh, love or, you know, the um, connection. Yes. Anyway, so, 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 so Nari, I mean, I also adopted two children, right? Two young girls. And my wife is the mother of those two young girls. And uh, this saying also applies to my wife for the children. So yes, okay. got your point, yeah. go ahead. What's your next question <laughs> okay. now? But, and then my last uh, is about the, the hereafter. Mm -hmm. I, I'm really confused about that because a lot of religion always say, you know, it's whatever, it, it's your good deeds, your karma, whatever. So, so I, I'm trying to wrap my head around it To Is it, is that done? What is your interpretation? Is that done when somebody is actually dying? They go through the purgatory of you know heaven and hell at the same time, or is it when you say judgment day? Is it because the world is ever evolving and we're having you know two thousand years we're living? So when is this actual judgment day? What is your interpretation of that? Wow. <clears throat> after everyone okay so there have been humans before us like thousands of years right so what we say is they are in a state of uh, maybe a different dimension right now they are sleeping they are dead they are different dimension after everyone passes away when the last day comes then every person who was ever alive would be resurrected back to life so when we pass away only god knows it can be tomorrow can be judgment day or 2000 years, 5000 years from now could be judgment day, right? Only God knows. So that time frame Quran does not discuss it. Neither does the old or the new Testament and definitely not the Vedas. So only this knowledge is up to God, right? He has not given the exact, like, you know, 21st of October, for example, 2023. It doesn't say like that. So what Quran is definite is that there will be a day in which we will be brought back to life. And there will be a day in which every single human, we will be just in front of God. You know, just like when we were uh, uh, evaluated in front of our teachers at the end of the semester, or when we have a six month evaluation at our work, for example, mm -hmm. in the same way, our grand evaluation would be on the day of judgment. 
So I don't know that if it is a confusing thing because we have that kind of justice in this world. Whatever that we have done, we are evaluated for and we get a A plus grade or an F grade, right? Based upon what we are doing in the classrooms. In the same way, we say the whole world is like a classroom. It's a testing ground for us, this world. And then on the day of judgment would be the grand evaluation and then the price or the punishment. I hope the price. Good question, Ari. Uh, yeah, really appreciate well, it. Yes. Well, th th thank you. But I, I, I think we all go through, we're going to go through our heaven and hell at the time of death or sometime in our life. We, we, we go through it right here. Sure, thank sure. You. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. Welcome. Excellent. You know, the Quran does say in chapter two, verse number 155, that God is surely going to test every single person through fear and hunger and loss of, loss of uh, property, loss of lives, but give glad tidings to those people who are patient, right? Who believe in Allah, who say to God we belong and to God we return. So we say that the test and challenges, and you may say there's heaven and hell, we say test and challenges would be to every single person in a different way. Maybe people of Afghanistan are having a different test compared to us living in the US. But again, being patient, persevering, Islam says God's reward would be there. Thank you. Let's see who is the next person here. Um, Phil. Yes. Yes, go ahead, brother. Yeah, uh, my question came from the family tree in part. It seems to me all three of the monotheistic religions uh, in some sense correlate with the, the house of evolution of life tree in which privilege is man at the very top. And uh, in the same way, you could just add that to the tree and that it really privileged man and civilization over nature. And uh, if that is the case, we have not managed nature very well. It is about to lead to our doom, or at least a severe punishment. Mm -hmm. I wonder what you think of the romantics notion of the power of creativity of the emergence, the emergent nature of understanding of nature that generates a more comprehensive understanding of life as it evolves. And whether this emergent quality, in a sense, puts man in a better balance with nature rather than a theistic notion in which privileges man over nature. And I wonder if that does not eventually evolve into a calling for a better understanding rather than just the privilege of man and maybe the superior man into the eventual reward of heaven or punishment of hell, rather than just the fact that nature in some deep sense is wiser than this quality of mankind himself mm -hmm. as a manifestation of monotheistic God. Could you say something about that? Sure, sure, wonderful. If I capture your question cor correctly, uh, Phil, um, I do understand and I do agree with you 100% that there should be a balance, there should be conservation, there should be a proper taking care of the resources which are around us. As we are not doing it, unfortunately, you know, by being arrogant and uh, exploiting the resources, unfortunately, our generation and the coming generations, they are going to be compromised. You know, Phil, you'll be surprised to find out uh, that Islam is a comprehensive faith and it being so, it has many, many uh, guidance that God has given about taking care of nature. So first and foremost, uh, the, the way that humans are made to think from the Quran is that we are given the responsibility, we are the leaders that God has created for the universe, not to abuse it and exploit it, because the Quran says that we are sent as the caliphs. We are the 
we are the ones who are the caretakers of the nature around us. That includes animals and the environment. So that's number one. Number two is that Quran is really big about you know going green, for example. So there is one of the there is one of the sayings of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, in which he said that even if you if there is a stream of water and you have to clean yourselves, you know, before praying, Muslims have to clean ourselves five times a day. Even if you have to clean yourself and there is abundance of water in front of you, like a big river flowing, even then conserve how much you use from the river. And there are many, many, I did a whole episode on my channel just on this topic of Islam and the conservation of environment. So, so unfortunate thing is that we have moved away from this guidance and we are exploiting the, the, the environment and uh, we are unfortunately creating the problem which is around us or the carbon gases and uh, the breakdown of the ozone layer and the temperature they said, you know, it is going to rise three degrees more in this century. That means what is going to happen, all the North Pole, South Pole water and all the coastlines would be compromised. But if you follow God's guidance, also for the nature and for the environment, you know, obviously we would be giving a good gift to our, our generations to come. So I can direct you, uh, Phil, to that episode that I have done on this topic. But in a nutshell, what I'm saying is Islam does provide guidance that aligns with what you're saying is that there should be a balance. So Islam does provide that balance for the humans. Doesn't matter what we wear, our environment around us, the food that we eat, the water that we converse, it has to be a balance. Yeah, but but even in that, it seems to me, uh, we are at best managing nature as a gardener, in the sense we're turning back to the Garden of Eden, rather than the fact that nature has its own manifestation. In other words, how does a plant worship God I mean, it doesn't have the knowledge to worship God. It just kind of grows. It emerges from the possibility of emerging. So how does plants do a good deed except to do the deed for itself? Uh, so wild nature is very different from a huge garden of Eden, <laughs> which obeys, in a sense, the laws of God rather than in a sense, its own emergence out of whatever its potentiality might be. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, I understand that. You know, I mean, obviously, we have to be caretakers and concern of the nature because they are also. I mean, we say that yes, plants are also worshiping God. Stones are worshiping God. That's the philosophy in Islam. Every single atom is worshiping the Creator. So we cannot disturb them. We have to leave them in their original state. But obviously, God has given us the responsibility to, uh, to consume them for our nourishment, right? You know, there is a saying of Muhammad, peace be upon him. I think I can leave you with this one is, mm -hmm. he said, even when the last day comes, even when the doomsday come, even if some of you have a palm shoot in his hand, he should plant it. Look at the mentality here. You know that nothing will happen. The doomsday is here. But the concept is that planting the trees is so important that even if it's the last day on the whole world, do it still. Right? So that's wonderful. I totally agree. Let's all work together for this wonderful gift that God has given to us, the nature, the environment. Yes. Thank you. All right. Welcome. Uh, the next one. Let me see who it is. Uh, Joseph. Go ahead, brother. Hi, uh, thank you, doctor, and thank you for presenting today, and thank you for taking the time to join us. Um, I've you'd mentioned the idea that uh, women were raised up to be equal in the in the eyes of God, um, but they have different responsibilities. Could you expand on what those responsibilities are, and how sometimes they get perverted, like in the media, uh, in how Islam views women? Okay. That's a whole new lecture, <laughs> by the way, right? We can have, but I, I will just be as uh, concise as possible. Okay. Because the topic of women in Islam is, you know, there was a study, uh, Joseph, that was done by USA Today. 
2016, I believe. And they did a survey of Americans you know, over here, and they found out that the number one misconception people have about Islam is women in Islam, right? And I can totally agree with that. So before Islam came to Arabia, I mean, women were mistreated, no freedom, no rights, no, you know, uh, they're not taken as equal. But after Islam came in, in that part of the world, God uplifted women equal to men in the eyes of God. Yes, different responsibilities. So what can be responsibilities? First and foremost, a man is the head of the household. You cannot have two head of the households, right? One head of the household, and that man is given the responsibility for finances, lodging, food, and clothing. I mean the basic necessities. That's his responsibility. But if need arises, a lady, his wife, his mother, his daughter, his sister, they can also go to work and share in the finances of the home. But it is not their responsibility, it is the man's responsibility. Women's responsibility, along with gaining education and working if need arises, her primary responsibility also is to give birth and take care of the children also, right? And obviously the man also have to have his share in taking care of the children, but I cannot give birth to any child, right? Neither can you, I guess. So since she can give birth, Allah gave her that honor. God gave her that honor. She was given the responsibility to nurture as a mother, breastfeed and do the rest of the things because someone has to take care of the children and make them into you know proper adults and good citizens of any country either man does it or women does it one of them has to have the primary responsibility if none of them do it then obviously the children would be compromised right so that could be one important uh, you know distribution of work under islam when it comes to the rights that Islam has given to women, you'll be amazed to find out. You know, so I'm from Illinois. In the state of Illinois, not until 1861, a white, white married Caucasian lady, she won the right to own property, 1861. Islam gave women the rights way back in the seventh century. In our country, not until 1920, a, a woman won the right to vote. Islam gave that right in the seventh century, the right to have a say in the political process. Not until 1844, a lady could go into higher education and get a PhD and graduate. Islam gave them the right way back in the seventh century. Not only Islam encouraged women to gain education, Islam obligates women to gain education along with men to such a degree that they were empowered you'll be surprised to find out that the oldest continuous university in the whole world, according to the Guinness Book of World Records and according to UNESCO, they were made by a Muslim lady wearing the hijab. Not until 1850, in this country, a lady cannot have the right to keep their own maiden name, their own family name. Islam gave them the right way back in the seventh century. So I can go on and on, but just in case, if we see that some Muslim cultures, some Muslim uh, societies and groups, if they have taken away that right that God has given to women, we blame them and not Islam. You know, just like, I mean, there are so many things happening in the Christian majority countries. I'm not going to bl blame, uh, right, Joseph or Christia, Christianity or the Bible and the New Testament. I will blame those fallible human beings and that culture. So that's about women in Islam, and I can go more, but in a nutshell, that's what Islam says. The honor, the respect, the responsibility given to women. Wonderful. Let's uh, bless you, uh, this is Nurul. I just want to come in for like 30 seconds, if you don't mind. Yes. So uh, I, I just want to mention that, uh, you know, Jason mentioned about Zach uh, earlier, about podcast. So Zach is also organizing three sessions with Dr. Sabil. Uh, the first one is on November 3rd. Islam 101 and then second session is about the Sharia law it's on November the 10th and the third session is about the women in Islam uh, it's on November uh, 17th so if you guys have time you can join that it's about from 5 p.m to 7 p.m it's on Wednesday the following weeks three weeks the, that will be you, you want to write it down over here in the chat yeah I'm gonna 
Yes, I'm going to mention that in the chat. Yes, please. Because what I would be doing is I'm going to isolate certain topics of misunderstanding like jihad, women in Islam, Sharia, right? And then only focusing on those just to let all our audience know what it is and what it is not, right? The myths versus fact kind of a comparison in yeah, those gonna, three topics, yeah. yes. Yeah, I'm going to mention that in chat. So if everybody, everybody is feel free to join them, please. Thank you. Sure, sure. Do you have any question also, by the way? Because you had, you had your no, hand no, raised just, up or that was... No, there, there was no question. I just wanted to mention that. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, then we have uh, Gyro. If I get the name right, I'm sorry. If I got your name wrong, I apologize. Yes, go ahead. Yes. Gyro. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Sabil Ahmed. Very yes, interesting. Um, so let's see. I, uh, I get the because uh, Islam came out of uh, Ju well, it's influenced by from Juda Judaism and Christianity. I guess it it borrows or, or recognizes the prophet and in, and also uh, it's the Abraham. Uh, I understand that. Ismail uh, came, uh, kind of was thrown out of the family and, and ended up uh, going away. And that brought, came, uh, that's where the Ar Arab people came, if I understand. And then, so there's a lot of commonality and, and it sounds like the, the end of times is similar or, or like uh, Judgment Day is similar in, in that uh, everyone will rise from the dead but is that is that rising is is it going to be purely physical or is it going to be like very subtle or something if it's going to be purely physical then how will the earth be able to handle that many people well it sounded like you, you believe that that the hum, humanity has only been around a, a few thousand years at, uh, before christ or what or do you believe that that humanity has been on earth uh, millions of years. So then there, there's, well, maybe it wasn't that big of a population all over the earth, but um, that's, a, that's more than four, seven billion people, plus all that, that have died since the beginning of, of uh, humanity, that could be a uh, hundred billion people. So how, how is the earth gonna handle that many people if it's gonna be physical? Thank you. Okay. All right. Wonderful. You had uh, one, two, three questions. All right. Let me just uh, go with the. Let me just go with the last question first. How is the Earth going to handle? Let's say fifty billion people, right? God knows how many people. Right now, it's close to eight billion. Maybe like you know, forty more billion people were there before us, right? Let's say approximately. Now. If God could have created the whole universe and look at all the trillions and trillions of galaxies which are out there. So don't you think that God can uh, handle, you know, 50 billion, you know, this tiny human beings, maybe he can stretch the earth, maybe he can just, maybe he can stretch the land. God can do that. Because if God can resurrect us, when we are like all nothing for thousands of years, God can create a, a earth uh, which is going to handle 50 billion or any number of people. All right. So that's one thing. Second thing would be how the resurrection is going to be according to Islam. We say the resurrection would be both in the body and in the soul, not just in the soul, unlike some other faiths, both our body and the soul. Our soul would be brought back to life. Even if our bodies were destroyed, for example, in the sea, in the fire, in the dust, God is going to bring us back to life as a body and put the soul back into it. And then we'll be standing in front of God for the physical judgment. And then we say that physically we will go into paradise for those God is going to let into paradise. And physically people are going to go into hellfire, right? So it's a physical resurrection, physical uh, rewards, along with the spiritual rewards for the people of paradise. All right. Uh, and then your first question was, uh, I, I'm not sure if you were able to phrase it uh, the way that I am understanding it correctly. You mentioned about Islam came out of Judaism, right? You were saying something about that. 
so what Islam believes is that Islam did not came as an offshoot of Judaism or of Christianity. We say that Islam is a guidance given independently by God. It was not evolved. It was not deviated. It was not an offshoot. We say the same God who sent Jesus, Moses, Abraham, Ishmael, and Isaac, and Noah, and Abraham, the same God also sent Muhammad, peace be upon him. So in a nutshell, what we say is that monotheism was the faith given by God to the very first man, Adam. And that monotheism later on, it was diluted. People started to worship humans and idols and the animals and the creation. So God kept on introducing pure monotheism through, through different prophets. And then to the last prophet, Muhammad, peace be upon him, he reintroduced monotheism and Islam. So Islam is not a seventh century faith. Islam, we say, is the same original uh, monotheistic guidance that God gave to the very first man, Adam. So I hope you're able to understand where we are coming from when it comes to the faith of Islam and the original guidance. Jairo, wonderful questions. I'm glad that you asked that because, you know, uh, people may have misunderstandings about that. And I'm, I hope that I'm able to clarify that. Thank you, brother. All right, now we have a pin. Go ahead. Hi, uh, thank you so much for excellent uh, presentation. Um, so I, I was in preparation for this meetup. I read uh, the assigned readings. So when I read chapter 19, uh, one thing that occurred to me was there's a lot of just the position of God being all merciful but also what the punishments that will happen to the non-believers. So I try to reconcile the logic. Um, what I arrived at is that God is all merciful to the believers, but not, not necessarily the non-believers. And perhaps God is all merciful in the sense that it, um, God gives a uh, maximum patience or tolerance for the non-believers to convert. Mm -hmm. I, I just want to confirm with you if that's, if I'm on, you know, if, if you would agree with my uh, observation or not. Okay, and, good. Uh, another question. Should I just Sorry, uh, quickly also... respond to that? Yeah, Should yeah, I quickly yeah, respond to that? Then you can come yeah, back yeah. to the next one also. Okay, fine. Yeah. So God is the God of the whole creation not only of the Muslims. So we say that we Muslims don't have a monopoly on Allah. Allah is the God of the whole creation, we say including you. So when God and his mercy comes into play, you know, his, uh, his mercy, his guidance, his uh, uh, nature of his attributes, all of them, they are in play benefiting even those who are not directly believing in God. For example, we say, our atheist brothers and sisters, when they're breathing oxygen, we say God is still giving them oxygen, even though they reject God. So God is still being merciful, even to the atheist brothers and sisters. So there are multiple levels of how God is helping, you know, humanity and the creation. Generally to the whole cosmos, obviously God is guiding it. And then to all of humanity, regardless of their uh, religious affiliation or no affiliation, God is still giving them oxygen and food and the health and things that they take for granted. And then obviously then to the believers, uh, because they are, they accept God, they follow God's guidance and they bear witness to the messengership of Jesus, Moses and Muhammad, peace be upon all of them and all the prophets. Obviously he's going to give them special favors, which is not, uh, you know, uh, odd when we look at it. Because suppose if you were a teacher and there were 50 students, or let's say 30 students, 50 is too many. Let's say 30 students in the class and five of them, they were not behaving good. 10 of them, they were like really behaving good and obeying you and following you. Obviously you may give some special incentive, some reward, some candy, some better grade for those who are core believing. But to the whole class, you will still be giving them instructions without discriminating based upon the race and the faith and the culture and the nationality. Right. So as God, God is giving holistic instructions to everyone. And obviously those who follow or don't follow, he's going to deal with them likewise. 
Yeah, thank you. Yeah. So I just want to repeat real quickly, make sure I understand you fully. Um, so I think what you're saying is that God is all merciful in its provision, uh, that, that it, the provision that God provides is unbiased, but not, but the merciful doesn't, uh, that, but the consequences of what people do is a separate matter. Yes and no again, because, uh, you know, unconsciously I and you and all of us, we can be committing so many sins, but you know what? Every single day, God is forgiving and forgiving by his mercy. If he wanted to, one sin, we could, we could be out, right? Punishment right away, throw in the hellfire right away. But he's giving us so many chances, not just in the provision, but also in his mercy, love, and guidance. So it's a holistic concept of mercy, not limited to only provisions. Thank you. So my next question is kind of related, and I'm sorry, I also have, you know, I have three questions total. But, um, um, you know, just yeah. ask one question, because I want to be just to all the others who are raising their hands, and then you can come back, you know, if you're okay with that, because uh, yeah. it's, it's yeah, yeah. fair to deal with every one who is here uh, raising the hand. So just ask one question, then come Absolutely. back. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yes. So this uh, goes back to the question I asked before, the distinction between the Sunnis and Shias. Oh. And also, PR, are Muslims in East Asia, you know, such as in uh, India, uh, China, Malaysia, and Indonesia, are, are they, are they uh, of the Shia branch or Sunni branch or neither? Okay, so Sunni Shia really quickly, right? I'm so glad that you were patiently waiting this whole one hour to ask the question. So when Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, when he was alive, uh, he was the head of the state and he was also the last prophet. After he passed away in the year 632, the Muslims, they have to appoint a new head of the state, like a new president, for example, right? But not a new prophet because the Quran says in chapter 33, verse number 40, that Muhammad, peace be upon him, is the last prophet. So to appoint a new head of the state, there were two major groups amongst the Muslims of that time, sixth century, in the year 632. The bigger group, Muslim group, they wanted to appoint Abu Bakr, who was the most qualified person, the closest person to Muhammad, peace be upon him. The second group, which is a smaller group, they also want to appoint uh, someone, son-in-law of Muhammad, peace be upon him, son-in-law and the cousin, his name is Ali, right? You may have heard his name, uh, but both of them were qualified. It so happened that Abu Bakr became the very first caliph and Ali became the fourth caliph, right? Because they were both qualified. They were both you know, good companions of Muhammad, peace be upon him. So the division was not because of theology initially, it was because of quote unquote politics in nature, right? Now, some people over here, they may be thinking that, you know, Sunnis and Shias, they're analogous to Protestants and uh, Catholics and Jehovah's Witnesses and Mormons. That's not the case because there are more things in common between the Sunnis and the Shias than the sects of Christianity or Hinduism, I would say, for example, all the Muslims, we believe in the absolute oneness of God. We all have only one concept of God, all the Muslims, Iran, Saudi Arabia, anywhere in the world. Unlike our Christian friends, they may have different concepts of God. Like the Jehovah's Witnesses, they don't believe in Trinity. Protestants, they do, and Catholics, they do. Muslims all over the world, we have only one version of the Quran in the Arabic language. Our Christian friends may have many versions of the Bible. You know. Uh, I'm a Bible collector. I have 300 Bibles in my collection, right? Ancient Bibles, different languages, different versions. I can show to anyone where changes, how changes have taken place. Different story, but different versions of the Bible. Muslims have one version of the Quran all over the world, all the time in history. So we are still united, right? One group. When we pray, we face the same direction of Mecca when we pray, all the Muslims in the world. Our concept of the here, hereafter is the same. So when it comes to the fundamentals, all the Muslims are kind of united. There are some theological differences uh, we have to know is that they believe in the Imams who should be successors to Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Means, you know, father to son to son, the Imams. What we say, the rest of the Muslims is, 
the person who is the most qualified should be the person succeeding to be the head of the state. They believe that the Imam sometimes can be infallible. You know, just like our Catholic brothers and sisters, they say Pope is infallible. Some of the Shia branch people, they say that uh, Imams are infallible. But these are small theological differences. When it comes to the overall view of Islam, all the Muslims are united in saying and believing in these fundamental views. But one important amazing thing is that if you look into the Quran, there is only one word the Quran gives to the followers of Islam. In chapter 22, verse number 78, it says that the followers of Islam are called as Muslims. It doesn't say Sunni Shia. So if you are going to stop me, suppose on the street and ask, you know, Dr. Sabil, who are you? Come on, are you a Sunni or a Shia? I say, brother, I am a Muslim. Yes. So your question about uh, India, Pakistan, who predominantly, they are from the Sunni side, right? They're from the Sunni side. Uh, Iran, Lebanon, some parts of Syria, they are from uh, the Shia brother side. But we say that everyone is a Muslim, equally eligible to go to paradise. Good question. I'm glad you waited patiently. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I just remind everybody, uh, if, uh, Dr. Shapir spent a lot of time talking about this. <laughs> and we have a lot of hands up. And I will suggest that we have the question briefly. So you know, we make sure everybody has a chance uh, to ask questions. Thank you. Thank you, Jason. So the next uh, question is uh, TCDU. If you can tell your name, if you want to, it's up to you. <laughs> sure. Hi, uh, Dr. Ahmed. Um, I had another type question, which I'll just Google later. Um, I suppose, given the discussion that has happened afterward. Uh, can you move your mouse close to the uh, microphone? We cannot hear you. I can phrase the question. Sure. Yes, go ahead. I suppose the kindest and most non confrontational way. Jason, can you hear the brother? I cannot because your voice is breaking up a little bit. Yeah, TC, I cannot hear you. Okay. Uh, the oh, so, sorry, we cannot hear you. We cannot hear you. So uh, I will put you on mute and uh, when you are ready. Family to include two husbands. Uh, TC, we cannot hear you. Sorry. No, okay. we cannot hear you. I'll type. Yeah, please type. I'm going to mute you for now. Okay, okay. so uh, please go to the next one. Yeah. Yes, uh, go ahead, David. You're next. Mind? Yeah, yes. Th thanks very much. I just feel sure. thank you very much for this very interesting and enlightening talk. A lot of information. I, I wanted. Oh, I think he's still there. Somebody's still talking uh, in the background. Somebody, that, okay, just one minute. Let, let me mute everybody and then um, so we can start. Okay, so I'm going to mute all. Okay. Uh, I'm going to mute all now and then, okay, uh, David, please start. Please unmute yourself. Can you yeah. hear me? Hello? Yeah, please, David. Please. Yes, thanks. Okay. DC, keep. So, so thanks for, I wanted to ask a, a little bit about, you mentioned in the presentation about justice. And I wanted to understand more because in Islam, um, Sharia law, that there is very specific definition of things that are forbidden, discouraged, permissible, recommended, or obligatory. Mm -hmm. um, so I wanted to understand the difference between exactly what justice means in Islam and related to that, the, the, the concept of uh, taqiyya and the um, um, deceit that's allowed in, in Islam for especially working with uh, infidels. And so how the Islam is able to uh, relate this concept of justice and that everybody's under this, uh, uh, this, this, this foundation, this, this infrastructure, uh, and yet there is this very different definition or, or a, a specific interpretation of, of justice and what's allowed in, in Islam that, that maybe is uh, different than what people expect the term to mean in, in the Western. Okay, wonderful. Thank you. So uh, the definition, a quick short definition that I can give from the Islamic sources about justice is that, gi that giving due rights 
to the recipients of the justice. Doesn't have to be humans, could be environment, could be animals, could be anyone. So the rights that Islam has given to that individual, that group, those people, even animals, if you are giving them the rights and dealing with them that way, we are dealing in just way with them, all right? So that's in a nutshell what justice is. And I can give you one example, right? So our brothers and sisters from the Jewish faith, when Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, when he moved from Makkah to Medina, uh, he found uh, many Jewish tribes living in Medina. One of, the, one of the constitutions that he dictated is that the Muslims and the Jewish people would be like one community. And then he gave them the autonomy, the rights, the freedoms to have their own faith their own justice system, their own uh, you know, culture, own synagogues, freedom to preach. And on top of it, he gave them the protection from the superpowers who were preying on the Jewish people. So when it comes to justice, he gave them the proper justice based upon the justice that Allah has given to them and he's just implementing it. Well, we're right, but, but the, the Quran also has in, in chapter three, section 28, you know, let believers not take for friends and allies infidels instead of believers. Whoever does this shall have no relationship left with Allah unless you but guard yourselves against them, take precautions. And similarly, in this you know, eternal war that you know, the, the, the war against you know, all, uh, shall go in perpetuity in Quran chapter 839, uh, section 39, all chaos ceases and all religions belong to Allah. So there is this ability to, to, to want to protect these other groups, but also the sense that these groups are separate and that, and that this war, that, that everything must eventually become unto Allah, unto Islam. Okay, wonderful. So, um, so that quotation that you made, that Muslims are not supposed to take uh, non-Muslims as friends, right? So again, uh, obviously that's an English translation, but that's an English mistranslation, right? If I see it Quran with that mistranslation, I would say to my non-Muslim brothers and sisters, you know what, don't read that one. That's a mistranslation. The actual word in the Arabic language is awliya. That means as a protectors, as a protectors, right? And we say that only Allah is the protector and obviously the Muslim, you know, just like way back in the 80s and 70s and 50s and 60s, there used to be uh, the Warsaw Pact and then the NATO people, correct? And obviously there used to be a, you know, demarcation between that. So in that way, if there is any, so that verse came in the context of the war situation. Remember I mentioned the 27 battles the prophet had to fight defensive battles. In the context of that war, these passages were revealed that in the context of a war, obviously you have, you're supposed to rely on your own people who are around you, right? But if we take the wrong interpretation that uh, the Jews and the Christians or the non-Muslims, we cannot take them as friends, there'll be a lot of trouble. And here is the reason for it. Muslim men are allowed to marry non-Muslim ladies, Jews or the Christians. So how can, I, if I marry a Jewish lady, for example, how can I, you know, hate her and discard her and not take her friend uh, when I'm like marrying her? So that is a wrong interpretation when it comes to, you know, the translation of the Quran. The actual word there is awliya. On top of it, uh, on top of it, David, there is a passage in the Quran, if I'm correct, somebody can double check, chapter 60, verse number eight and nine. Chapter 60, verse eight and nine. It speaks up there that deal justly with all the people, despite their racial, whatever background, as long as they're not like, you know, kicking you out of their homes. So the default state of Islam and Muslims in the world is to deal with justice and peace and equality with all of humanity. So that's the default state. The default state is not war. War is a necessity sometimes for the existence. If somebody is imposing war, you have, and I have, everyone has a God-given right to defend ourselves. The Quran says that in chapter two, verse number 190, fight in the cause of those people, uh, fight in the cause of Allah uh, for those who are fighting against you. But even, in that, uh, but even in that war, do not go to extreme because God does not love the extremist. I'm quoting you the translation here. So God is saying that if war is imposed on you, then you have the God-given right to take up arms. 
So the default state of Islam is to live in justice and justice brings peace in the world. So every single passage has to be dealt in the proper context in which it came in the proper Arabic that we need to know at least you know the bigger concepts so we don't do injustice to the Quran and the passages. Thank you, David. Good questions. Uh, Dr. Shabir, and let me, uh, I, I, TC has a question, you know, and he, you, you want to read it? Uh, oh, okay, a, yeah, yeah, let me read it. Uh, I'm not sure uh, if, if you want to answer. Yeah. Okay, does Ahmed ever see the definition of family to include two husbands or two wives? <laughs> okay. Interesting, TC. <laughs> All right. Um, so the Quran does permit in certain situations polygamy of multiple wives up to four wives. And those of you who are writing it down, I applaud you. This is in chapter four of the Quran, verse number three. Chapter four, verse number three says, uh, marry two, three, up to four. But if you cannot do justice, again, the word justice is here, David. If you cannot do justice, marry only one. So these verses also came in the proper context. You know what? There used to be so many wars at that time. And so many men used to be you know, killed. And there used to be access of women. And obviously, they were unprotected in the society. So in exceptional situations, exceptional verses came. But the important fact here is that Islam did not introduce polygamy. Polygamy always existed in the history of humanity, but what God did was it restricted polygamy and it gave responsibility to the husbands. That if you're going to marry more than one, up to four, right? You have to do 100% justice to both the wives or all the four wives. If you cannot do justice, marry only one. I know I cannot do justice. Plus I'm living in America, right? Forget about marrying more than one. Even in the Old Testament, DC, even in the Old Testament, in the first book of Kings, chapter number 11, verse number two, three, and four, it mentions that King David, uh, uh, Solomon actually, Solomon, he had uh, 700 wives. And many of the prophets of the Old Testament, they had multiple wives. Not a single time God prohibited polygamy in the Old Testament. So what I'm saying is that almost all the face of the past, all the cultures of the past, they had polygamy even in the scriptures. Later on, the church and the constitutions, they prohibited it. But, but, but last but not the least, Jason, this is what I say for this important question is, in Chicago Tribune, there was a survey that was taken. According to this survey, a typical American male, uh, he has in the lifetime average seven extramarital or premarital affairs. It's a reality, right? But just look at the situation. If a person has an affair, if a guy has the affair, boyfriend, girlfriend, whatever combination, uh, now you know she gets pregnant and he can walk out, zero responsibility to him, he can be hiding. Now she has to raise the child herself. And we know from a psychological point of view, from a sociological point of view, uh, when a child is raised by only single parent, there are more chances that the child is going to have a lower IQ, more prone to diseases, you know, a weaker immune system from the medical point of view, a greater chance to drop out from schools and colleges, a greater chance of being unemployed, more chance uh, to, to take up guns and violence and gangs and drugs. The vicious cycle continues. So Islam has given a solution. If you like someone, if the country allows it, then God says up to two, three or four, cannot do justice, marry only one. So this is a guidance that we say, it protects women from exploitation from the society. Good question, brother. Can I just say 30 seconds to something <laughs> to that? It's, it's, it's I, a hard I, topic, I live, but go ahead. Yeah, I, I live in Canada and you know, I, I, I'm, I'm sorry, but you know, some men here and I wouldn't name what countries, but they aren't really taking advantage of, of this uh, uh, written in a Quran, taking more and one. They can only marry one in, in North America legally, but they, they seem to have more than one. Uh, I don't know, maybe they marry in, in, um, 
in the religious rights and uh, they're carrying on with that. But I, a couple of cases that I know of and I've heard, it's really using it to, to their advantage. And like anything else, there's some bad apples in the barrel. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, of course, you know, I mean, any person doesn't have to be Muslim, even many people, we take, they take advantage of uh, our constitution. You know, many of the bigger companies like Apple and Google and Microsoft, right, they pay zero taxes. People take advantage. It's a, just a human nature, doesn't have to do anything with Islam. People take advantage of Christianity, Judaism, any faith, any culture, any constitution, right? So if people are taking advantages, unfortunately, we have to blame them, but not the original intent of that constitution. So uh, I'm sorry to have a TC leave. Uh, I was going to respond to his second question, which was about, uh, can a wife take two husbands? No, that is prohibited in Islam, Christianity, and Judaism, and other faiths. Uh, okay, so let's see. Next uh, question. Uh, these are interesting questions. I'm, uh, so there is an iPhone question, iPhone 12, 20. Uh, go ahead, brother, sister, not sure. Um, yes, hello, uh, and this is Alina, and thank you. My question, uh, Dr. Sabil, is about ancestral traditions in Islam and the, the role of the family clan. And um, I just do notice that the family ties are also kept and, and treated as sacred in a way because of uh, here in the Western world, it could you know, could be truly, could disengage from your family versus um, in the East, I see the ties are really being maintained and being given way, way more, say, um, how to say, it's, it's being impor important and being preserved and being used as well in positive ways. So um, what's, what's your opinion on that and everything that you could share? Thank you. Yes, yes. Uh... You are very much right. Uh, family and extended family and the lineage up and down, highly cherished, highly valuable in Islam. You know, I have six siblings, including myself. Five of us, we live in Chicago land area. Even though Chicago is cold, I would still like to live up here because five of my siblings, they live very close to me. And that is a blessing, believe me. That's a blessing. I mean, I could have moved to Dallas, California, Florida, warmer weather, right? Forget about snow in Chicago. It's coming very soon. But the family is so important for us. Not only our immediate, um, so I'm married to somebody from Pakistan, right? Now I, so marriage is not just between a husband and wife. The concept of marriage in Islam is that, yes, uh, now you're including all the in-laws in the marriage to some degree, right? And the in-laws from my side to some degree. So now it's a union between not two people, but two big humongous families. So I hope you can understand, right? The picture that Islam is building, it came to unify people and the families and respecting uh, of not just our parents, but their parents and their parents, like many, many you know, uh, degrees. However, there is a small exception to it. And that exception is respect and love and admiration and obedience have its place. However, Islam is really strong when it comes to not blindly believing anyone, not even our parents, grandparents, ancestors, leadership of the clan and culture, if they are going against the clear cut guidance of the creator. If the family, if the ancestors of our culture says, you know what, let's worship this creation, this idol, this human or this uh, creation as God along with God instead of God, I would say that, no, I respect you, but I disagree with you. So I say that Islam is a faith of intellectuals. Allah has, God has given us a brain, a mind to think and ponder. You know, in fact, the word uh, think and ponder and reflect, it is mentioned 750 times in the Quran, just to obligate and motivate and to encourage people and the humans don't blindly follow. Your ancestors, they may be right, they may be wrong. So yes, when it comes to ancestors and family, love, admiration, respect, unity is there with their small disclaimer about ideology.
and in chapter four, verse number one speaks about, uh, you know, not cutting off the family ties, the blood ties, doesn't matter what happens, right? Uh, so, I mean, Islam came to unify humanity. So let me just leave it at that. It's a wonderful system for, for our kids. Oh, All right, uh, I think uh, she was the last one. Wow, I'm surprised. Okay. Oh, James, James, yes. your hand is back. I have a, a difficult question. <laughs> I, uh, okay. my, my uh, oldest daughter had a uh, friend in high school who uh, coached her in uh, calculus, you know, a young woman who was brilliant in mathematics. And uh, we were, she was tortured basically by her father and her brother. Uh, he, he, who was even younger, I believe, uh, but uh, basically uh, constantly hounded, you know, for uh, being inferior, uh, for being a woman. And uh, it, it was sad to hear uh, on graduation that she didn't, she decided not to uh, uh, major in science and mathematics, which is somewhat common in the United States. I won't say that it doesn't happen uh, in the general population at all. But uh, and they were Muslim family. Um, the uh, I was taking my son and a friend of his, who was the son of um, uh, a Muslim family, uh, who were friends of mine. Uh, and I was driving them uh, from a school event, and um, uh, he was telling an anti-Semitic joke in the car, and. Uh, so which was uh, kind of interesting. And then he started to tell another anti-Semitic joke. And I know that he was going to a madrasa. So, so I, don't, uh, I don't know if that had to do with this issue, but I had to stop the car and explain to him that we do not allow those kinds of jokes in our family so that he was supposed to, he had to stop. Um, I was wondering if this ever has happened to you or to members of your family. Uh, is this is this something that uh, is common in the in the culture, or is it, uh, at, or it or just has how has it affected you personally? Okay, um, I think you started off with science, and that uh, some members of her family was discouraging this lady, this girl, from entering some fields of science. I mean, I would say that would be just a cultural or a cho choice of the family. Mm -hmm. Because my wife is a physician. She's coming from Pakistan, right? Encouraged to enter the field of science. So it's just a personal choice. It's not, it doesn't have anything to do with Islam or Muslims. You know, there can be many families, Jewish, atheist families who would like their kids to enter this field or that field. So it is not uh, Islam specific or Muslim specific, I would say. You know, there are two, two billion Muslims around the world. If some pockets in some countries may believe that way, okay, fine, that is their culture. But it's not uh, a Islam specific uh, way to dictate our children which feel that they can take. And definitely the Quran does not. In fact, the Quran, the, the saying of Muhammad peace be upon him is to obligate every lady, every girl to gain education. Nobody can stop them, right? Not even their husbands. When it comes to anti-Semitic jokes, and obviously, you know, as humans, we cannot take anti-black anti jokes, anti-white jokes, anti-Semitic jokes, anti-Arab jokes, or any anti-jokes. But, you know, this is such a fun, funny term, anti-Semitic, because if that person was an Arab, he is a Semite, right? Arabs are Semite too. So I'm not sure if anti-Semitism, if they say a joke, they're saying it against themselves. I don't, I don't, I don't want to embarrass you, but this was a joke about Jews, specifically right, right. about Jewish people, sure. a Jew and so on. Sure, sure. You know, uh, I mean, obviously that's that person saying it and I'm not going to judge uh, that person's faith and book and whatnot, because unfortunately in our culture, people see it funny as joking against certain other people, right? They may just take it, they may have different intent, but unfortunately, you know, we, I mean, I don't do it, by the way, but we have seen some comedians doing it. They can be of different races and cultures and nationalities. People joke against each other's faith and culture and background, races. So in fact, you know, James, you'll be surprised to find out if you just look at what Islam says about Jews and the Christians, 
31 times in the Quran, Islam respects the Jews and the Christians with the phrase, people of the book. They are exalted by saying, these are the people of the book. You know, Mary, a Jewish lady who came 600 years before Muhammad, peace be upon him, is the only lady mentioned by name in the whole Quran. Not uh, the mother of Muhammad, peace be upon him, not his wife, not his daughter or sister, but a Jewish lady, quote unquote, who came 600 years before Muhammad, peace be upon him. So that shows, you know, I mean, the love, the admiration, the peaceful coexistence that Islam has done all throughout the centuries. You know, I made a video on my channel. If you go to my name, Sabil Ahmed, on the YouTube, you will find my channel. In there, I went over top 10 reasons that how Islam has helped our Jewish brothers and sisters from the advent of Islam all the way to our times. Some of the oldest churches and the synagogues are found in the Muslim land. They were preserved for literally, you know, more than 1000 years. Uh, the golden age of Judaism was under the Muslim Spain. And this has been said by the Jewish encyclopedia. Many of the Jewish scholars after they were persecuted in many places in Europe, they came to the Muslim land and they were thriving up there. Uh, you know, just in the recent World War II, recent means 18 years ago, there were literally many, many Muslim countries, they made a pact saying that we're not going to handle a single Jewish person to the Nazis. So they wrote, the Muslim countries, the officials, they wrote false passports and documents for the Jewish people, saying that these are our people, we are not going to hand them over. So in that way, 75,000 Jewish brothers and sisters, they were saved by the Turkey, the government of Turkey, by being handed over to the Nazis. Iran saved 2,000 people. So I documented all of these in my video that how Muslims protected and saved and given dignity to our Jewish brothers and sisters, right? So if you find some of these remarks, this is so unfortunate. We have to stop the car and you know not let them continue. Islam does, doesn't have anything to do with it. If somebody is saying that, it doesn't matter what faith, nationality, and culture, we all have to make sure that we nicely advise that brother or sister against saying that. Okay, I just like to remind everyone right now it's three o'clock and uh, Dr. Shapir, thank you so much. And if you are willing to stay, that's fine. If you have other uh, thing, uh, 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 